translation. He saw that the sacrifices mentioned in the Vedas were means by which the people's occupations could be purified. And to simplify the process, he divided the one Veda into four in order to expand them among men. Srila Prabhupada. Formerly there was only the Veda of the name Yajur, and the four divisions of sacrifices were there specifically mentioned. But to make them more easily performable, the Veda was divided into four divisions of sacrifice, just to purify the occupational service of the four orders. Above the four Vedas, namely Rig, Yajur, Sama, and Atarva, there are the Puranas, the Mahabharata, Samhitas, etc., which are known as the fifth Veda. Sri Vyasadeva and his many disciples were all historical personalities, and they were very kind and sympathetic toward the fallen souls of this age of Kali. As such, the Puranas and the Mahabharata were made from related historical facts which explain the teachings of the four Vedas. There is no point in doubting the authority of the Puranas and the Mahabharata as parts and parcels of the Vedas. In the Chandogya Upanishad 714, the Puranas and the Mahabharata, generally known as histories, are mentioned in the fifth Veda. According to Srila Jiva Goswami, that is the way of ascertaining the respective values of the revealed scriptures. Om Jnana Tamarandasya Gyananjana Salakaya Chaksus Unmaditamina Tasmai Sri Guru Venama Sri Chaitanya Manobhistam Stapitam Yena Bhutale Swayam Upagadamayam Dadanti Swapadantikam Jai Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Garadhara Shri Vasari Gaur Bhakta Vinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare Vanchakalpa Chubhishcha Kripa Sindhu Pyavcha Patitanam Pavane Vyo Vaishnavi Vyo Namo Namaha So the verse again Chatyotram Karmasvidham Ragnam Vichai Vaidikam Vyadhara Jagna Sant Taityai Veda Mekam Chatur Vidham. He saw that the sacrifices mentioned in the Vedas were means by which the people's occupation could be purified. And to simplify the process, he divided the one Veda into four in order to expand them among men. So he, we're talking about Sri Vyasadeva, who's very kind, as it says here. Probably mentions in the purport there that's highlighted in red. Sri Vyasadeva and his many disciples were all historical personalities, and they were very kind and sympathetic toward the fallen souls of this age of Kali. So, this is an example of a real leader, a real personality who is concerned for the citizens. <clears throat> that's Sri Vyasadeva. And there it shows, this is a, I've used this picture several times. It's a very favorite for this particular chapter and pastime of how he's guiding the conditioned souls, which are in the darkness of ignorance, to the real light and to the real purpose of their lives. So we're very fortunate to have these available. But unfortunately today, instead of focusing on these into literatures, people are more interested, it seems like, in getting money. That seems to be the most important thing. Here's the, what their focus is, trying to get money, thinking that money is everything, but actually it's very temporary. It can be finished at any moment, just like this life. So here's a about the best advice you're going to get to a person who has just graduated maybe from college or some school system. They say, you know, I went through all these years and I don't know what, what, to, what I want to do. I don't know what I'm going to become. I'm not sure. So this is what they'll say. 
you know, well, what's more important to you? Money? Is that why you what you want to do? But he says here, if it is, you'll spend your life completely wasting your time. You'll be doing things you don't like doing in order to go on living. That is going on doing things you don't like doing. That is stupid. Better to have a short life that is full of what you like doing than a long life spent in a miserable way. It's absolutely stupid to spend your time doing things you don't like in order to keep on doing things you don't like. <laughs> so not only that, but when you do that, then what you're doing is you're also an example to your children, and then they're going to follow the same track to bring up their children, and then to bring up their children to do the same thing. So what we desire is most important, and this, unfortunately, people don't know. Just like these students, they don't know what they want to do, their desire. They think is to get money and to work hard so that we could go on doing things that we don't like doing. This is the plight of our society. People are out, you know, trying to get a job. <clears throat> but that's also just comes and goes. There's actually a, uh, a new science out. This is actually a bona fide science. It's called the science of happiness. And there's Nobel Prize winners that are quite reputable that are actually behind this. And this is what their conclusion is from their studies. You know, about happiness. Beyond a basic middle class of living, any further increase in your income or luxuries do not increase happiness or life satisfaction. So this conclusion is actually measured by their standard psychological indicators. The more we enhance our economic development, you know, striving actually unnecessarily, you know, is that our success? So here, there's a disconnect between what they're actually, you know, going to school for, they're studying to get knowledge, to get intelligence, but there's a disconnect between intelligence and knowledge. You know, in, in older times, people would study to get wisdom, to virtue, to be fully informed. But now it says that actually the whole purpose of education now is to help the economy. Actually, David Mitoswani was saying that in New Zealand, that's, that's the motto <coughs> of a university there is to improve the e economy. So this is what it seems, the focus is now towards money. <clears throat> but what is this getting us? There's the, uh, the WHO states, it's the World Health Organization. They say the fastest growing disease in this world is mental depression. Is that our path to success, is madness? Is this what our goal is? Business as usual? Working for Boring Incorporated? But actually, human beings are meant for enlightenment. We don't belong here, actually. There's an eminent biologist, you know, of the 21st century, his name's Ian Wilson, and he stated that the human species is the only species that if eliminated, won't have a chain reaction. See, they've studied, like if you eliminate a particular type of ant or a particular type of species, it actually affects, there's a reaction in, in nature. But if the human species were eliminated, nature would be very happy. They'd probably be happy to get rid of the human species, which is destroying. It's the only species that destroys its own habitat. That's totally ridiculous. So this is the problem. We have human beings with a low consciousness and how actually it's not an economic problem, it's a moral problem. And uh, because there's actually a crisis of identity. There's another famous scientist, Stephen Hawkins said, all we are, you know, why are you worried? We're just chemical scum 
on a moderate-sized planet. So just see, we don't even know who they are. They have no control of their mind and their senses. Humanity has no clue of its identity or how it can be uplifted. So if someone has this idea that, oh, you're just chemicals, then why should anything matter? Why should education matter? Why should education matter? You know, why should this environment matter? And to bring the point further, you know, here's the Grand Canyon. And uh, this is, uh, I think that same scientist made this analysis, a biologist. From the latest re recording that I found is that there's 6.93 billion human beings on this planet. And if you had them as biomass packed into a box, 1.3 cubic miles, and you lowered that into a remote part of the Grand Canyon, it would be completely gone. You know, just so insignificant. It shows our significance of our physical isms that we have. We think we're these bodies. But actually, this physical nature is temporary. It's not who we are. It's very insignificant. So this is where the ancient spiritual wisdom of India has been teaching for many, many centuries. But now it's being forgotten. But it seems nowadays there's uh, people that are actually bringing out from scientific s studies and, you know, from experience, these things that the Vedas have been teaching for centuries. There's a, <clears throat> a universal application of techniques for uplifting and purifying our consciousness given to us in the wisdom of India. This is important, purifying our consciousness. There's a top economist, Jeffrey D. Sachs. He's of the Earth Institute at Columbia University. And this is uh, what he said. We have a character problem in the USA, not an economic problem. What the United States needs is virtue moderation, compassion, and inner awareness. So he was, he was announcing this to the press, and one of the press people asked him, well, then where do we get this virtue? How do we get this virtue? And he said, well, that's not my department. I'm an economist. So see, they give all this study and analysis of our problems, but where is the solution? They don't really know how to develop these things within Here's uh, the book that he wrote, which is a, probably a bestseller, The Prize of Civilization, Reawakening American Virtue and Prosperity. <clears throat> this uh, Jeffrey Sachs is actually probably among the world's three most influential living economists of the past decade. And is world-renowned, is a leader in sustainable development, is a senior UN advisor, is a best-selling author. You know, he's, uh, he has syndicated columnists in uh, monthly newspaper columns, which appear in more than 80 countries. So, you know, he's a very, you know, top personality. And if you go to this link I have here, this, uh, he has this uh, uh, video, and he talks about the state of our society and our government and how we're actually gutting our government. You know, they've actually said government <clears throat> isn't the solution. It's actually a problem. So we should get rid of government regulations and let, you know, so they just, you know, they, uh, they're bought out with lobbyists and bribes and, you know, they're so selfish, just interested in themselves and they don't care about the citizens at all. So this is very, very uh, interesting uh, video. I recommend you guys check out. It's pretty nice. And then there's another book that was written by this uh, neurosurgeon, Evan Alexander. And uh, he was totally against these near-death experiences. He was, uh, you know, saying, oh, this is just of the mind. There's just some, you know, something going on in in the, the mind, it's some kind of halluc hallucinations and so many different things. So this is what he believed until he actually had 
a near-death experience himself. And so he wrote this book now. It's like a number one bestseller. <clears throat> My son was just pointing out to me that there's probably 3,000 reviews. or I don't know if it's 3,000 or 30,000 reviews on this book, which, you know, I don't think... I mean, he said he's never heard of such a, so many reviews given on one book. So this is proof, and he's had experiences in the book, you know, which relate to the Vedic, which the Vedas have been teaching us for centuries. So where are we to learn these virtues? These are the spiritual solutions of the Krishna consciousness movement. They can give us a luxury of life that you can't buy with money. There's so many spiritual technologies given to us in the spiritual texts of India. And they are helped to uplift the human being. And that begins with chanting of the holy names of God. So these virtues like moderation, you know, understanding how to control the senses, understanding who we are, seems like today there's no distinction between what our real needs are and what our wants are. I mean, we desire things. We want this. We want that. And we think we need it because we've been programmed by so much media and so many different things. He explained in that movie and that video I was recommending of that economist. He was saying, well, all this is happening to our, to our citizens. What are they doing? They're sitting around watching TV. They're, I think America is the, is the most, uh, they watch the most TV of any other country in the world. But now we can see there's so much cutting edge information as we have these books on near-death experiences, bestsellers, describing the state of affairs, which we're warned against in the Vedas. And some people are actually beginning to realize these things. So we're very fortunate that we're able to learn these virtues from who else but Srila Prabhupada, the formal scholar, you know, and devotee of Krishna in this particular age. He's actually Jagat Guru, the guru of the entire universe. Mm -hmm. And he's given us this transcendental knowledge that we can follow through his books, through his lectures, his translations. Here's a very nice thing Srila Prabhupada said about his books. There is no literature throughout the universe like Srimad Bhagavatam. There is no comparison or competition. Every word is for the good of human society. Each and every word. Therefore we stress so much in the book distribution Somehow or other, if the book goes in one's hand, he will be benefited. At least he'll see, I have taken so much price, let me see what it is there. If he reads one sloka, his life will become successful. If he reads one sloka, one word, this is such a nice thing. Therefore, we are stressing so much. Please distribute books, distribute books distribute books. So this is Sri Prabhupada. But not only that, Guru Aswami was just giving a lecture here. He was here for Nityananda's appearance day that, you know, he remembers and of a personality who even touched the book. He just touched the book and he realized that this book, I mean, he had some, just by touching, he realized this is something that I need to follow, this is something that I need to do. He had some kind of experience so just by touching a book, or to speak of reading one word, your life can change. Because these books are actually alive. They speak to you. They're non-different than Krishna. So we have to understand these books and apply them in our life. After all, as we mentioned, everything is temporary. And they probably used to quote that Bengali proverb that all of your bhajan sadhana will be tested at the time of death. So we all have to face that. So we should prepare now. Your song was talking about how <clears throat> he was on the phone just yesterday with um, a devotee in India who's leaving his body. He didn't mention his name, but he said he used to be 
in uh, St. Louis. I think he was a temple president there. And then just this morning it was announced there's a devotee or neighbor right here, a devotee, my godbrother. He had a heart attack this morning. So these are happening all around us. But yet we think, oh, this is so, you know, my life is so important. You know, everything here is very, like these problems. There's so much stuff to be bothered or happy about here. But this life is so small. Just imagine, it's like one one tenth of a billionth of a second is this life. It just comes back in a flash. It's no comparison to eternal time. So we have to do things that have value of eternal time, like chanting, devotional service, reading, being mindful of the, of the real facts of life. <clears throat> and then we'll find a real happiness is actually the relation of the soul with Krishna. And if we keep reminding ourselves of these things, we won't be distracted on the fertility of material enjoyment. And this is what Lord Chaitanya and Lord Nityananda came to dispel this darkness of ignorance. Even if we do have to work, the main thing is the consciousness. Because actually the consciousness is the platform of attachment. What do you attach to? You know, you have to work, you're serving your family, you know, because you have to, you're responsible, right? It's described that no one should become a spiritual master, a relative, a father, mother, worshipful deity, a husband, if you can't help your dependents escape from the imminent path of death. So this is what we should do. Our consciousness should be engaged that we're working for a particular purpose. And also, how do we utilize our time when we're not working? What are you doing with your extra time? This is important. We have to realize that what is the real value? We should be acting and doing things that have the value of eternal time. So let's dive into some of these transcendental literatures that have been given to Sri Prabhupada. There's one nice verse that reminded me of that uh, quote from that, you know, counselor who's saying, you know, better to live a short life than to live a life doing what you don't like to do. <clears throat> but here's what the Vedas say about that. What's the value of a prolonged life which is wasted, inexperienced by years in this world? Better a moment of full consciousness because that gives one a start in searching after his supreme interest. And in the purport here, Sri Prabhupada says, Srila Sukadeva Goswami instructed Maharaj Prikshit about the importance of chanting the holy name of the Lord by every progressive gentleman in order to encourage the king who had only seven remaining days of life. Srila Sukadeva Goswami asserted that there is no use in living hundreds of years without any knowledge of the problems of life. Better to live for a moment with full consciousness of the supreme interest to be fulfilled. The supreme interest of life is eternal with full of knowledge and bliss. So we're all bewildered by this external feature of the material world. And if we get too absorbed, then what do we just engage in the animal propensities of just drinking, you know, merry type of life, eat, drink, and be merry? Just simply waste our lives in the unseen passing away of valuable years. So here's a, some more of that purport here. Prabhupada says here, We should know in perfect consciousness that human life is bestowed upon the conditioned soul to achieve spiritual success. And the easiest possible procedure to attain this end is to chant the holy name of the Lord. And Prabhupada writes here, as far as distinguishing the Lord's holy name from other demigods, as revealed in the scriptures, that all extraordinary powerful beings are but parts and parcels of the supreme energetic Lord Krishna. Except for the Lord himself, everyone is subordinate. No one is independent of the Lord. Since no one is more powerful than or equal to the energy of the supreme Lord, no one's name can be as powerful as that of the Lord. 
And this is the one sentence from my purport. By chanting the Lord's holy name, one can derive all the stipulated energy synchronized from all sources. So just see, that's our activity. It should be, you know, even for a, a moment, it's never compared to a prolonged life of ignorance, this activity of full consciousness and devotional service. It's never to be compared to a prolonged life of ignorance. Like the lives of trees or other living entities who live for thousands of years without even prosecuting, you know, spiritual advancement. So when, when we're engaged in these, these chanting of the holy names of the Lord, we have, it's very critical that we have to uh, be careful of our offenses and not criticize other devotees, even in the mind, because it leads to more offenses. We have the story of Pandari Kaniti and of uh, Lord, Lord uh, Jagannath's pastimes, where he thought that these devotees of Lord Jagannath, they're wearing these contaminated clothes, they're starched, they're not even washed. But he had a dream, Lord Jagannath slapped him, you know, and when he woke up, his face was all red. So we have to be careful of these offenses. So we have, as devotees, we have to understand that we can chant, we have so much power, all this stipulated energy synchronized from all sources. We have that available to us. But we, we have to keep it by careful of our offenses. Now here's another verse where we come to Pritu Maharaj. He was such a great, he was so great in his activities and magnanimous in his method of ruling that all the kings and demigods on the various planets still follow in his footsteps. Who is there who will not try to hear about his glorious activities? I wish to hear more and more about Pritu Maharaj because his activities are so pious and auspicious. So this is what really has the purified activities. Kama Sutta. His, his activities are purified. Here Prabhupada says, St. Vidura's purpose in hearing about Pritu Maharaj all over and over again was to set an example for ordinary kings and executive heads who should all be inclined to hear repeatedly about Pritu Maharaj's activities in order to also be able to rule over their kingdoms or states very faithfully for the peace and prosperity of the people in general. So unfortunately today at this present moment, Nobody cares about Pritu Maharaj or to follow in his footsteps. We can see our leaders today have fallen short of this. <clears throat> so what's happening? That they're not happy. People are bored. They're not progressive in spiritual understanding. They don't know the sole aim of life. So this is another verse from that same chapter about Pritu Maharaj. The citizens continued, Today you have opened our eyes and revealed how to cross to the other side of the ocean of darkness. By our past deeds and by the arrangement of superior authority, we are entangled in a network of fruitive activities and have lost sight of the destination of life. Thus we have been wandering within the universe. So here the citizens are admitting that the benefit they were deriving from their king, who actually loved them, who was concerned about the citizens. Now, like today, they're just concerned about themselves. They don't care about the citizens. Otherwise, look at our health program. Look at our educational programs. All these things are being eliminated and just favor of the industries. Great big companies are controlling the world now and polluting our environment. All the living entities, they're wandering within the universe. They're subjected to these laws of karma and transmigrating from one body to another, from one planet to another. And this is the whole scheme of the Vedic process. It's to meant to save all these wandering living entities from the clutches of Maya. Birth, death, disease, old age. This means stopping the cycle of birth and death. And this is what the king, how he loved the citizens and what their whole purpose of life was. 
He was actually helping them, helping the real personalities, the souls, go back and get free from this entanglement. So today we see devotees out in St. Nikertan, they're giving and getting the mercy. It's described how, you know, we've, we've uh, devotees are talking about this, we're going to not as appearance day. And there was a quote mentioned about how in order to get Radha and Krishna's mercy, we need to get Lord Chaitanya's mercy. And in order to get Lord Chaitanya's mercy, we need Lord Nityananda's mercy. And how do you get Lord Nityananda's mercy? Is that we have to approach the Jagais and the Madais. And this is what the Prophet has given us, this activity. Not only giving us this knowledge, you know, on distributing the mercy, but how to also get the mercy of Lord Nityananda. So today, is from the calendar, is... Uh, none other than the appearance day of Sri Narutama Das Thakur. Actually, Narutama means like a perfect person. He was actually the son of a king. And he showed all the bodily symptoms of a Mahapurusha, an exalted divine person. It's described that he had long arms, he had a deep navel, he had a golden complexion, Beautiful eyes shaped like lotus petals. In school, he was actually a Shruti Dara. He was able to memorize everything that he heard. You know, if he just heard it once, he'd memorize it forever. Although he was a very good student, he quickly mastered Sanskrit and all the Vedas. His only hankering was to serve Krishna. So he remained a lifelong brahmachari. And by the mercy of the holy name, Goranitai, he actually Norton became detached. And he left his opulent family, he ran to Vrindavan, and that's where he took uh, Diksha from Lokamath Goswami, and he took Shiksha from Jiva Goswami. So here's something that's very nice that we uh, sang. Uh, actually, this is for Nityananda's appearance day. And this is a song by Narutama Das Thakur. And I'm just going to go through the purport that Sri Prabhupada gave us for the song. And what Narutama Thakur says, he says, if you're anxious to go back to home, back to Godhead, and become an associate of Radha and Krishna, then the best policy is to take shelter of Nityananda. So he's here again, confirmed, we need to take shelter of Nityananda. And how do we get shelter of Nityananda? is that we have to approach the Jagais and Madais. So this is what Srila Prabhupada has given us, the opportunity on how to get this mercy. Then he says, Se sambandhas nahi jar pitya janma genotar. One who has not been able to contact Nityananda, then one should think himself that he has simply spoiled his valuable life. Therefore, those who are intelligent, they are not interested with this flickering pleasure of the material world. Every one of us, as living entity, we are searching after pleasure. But the pleasure which we are seeking, that is flickering, temporary. That is not pleasure. Real pleasure is Nityananda, eternal pleasure. So anyone who has no contact with Nityananda is to be understood that his life is spoiled. So this sort of means that Britya, Janma Gelo, that Britya means nothing, and Janma means life. So it's Gelo Tar spoiled, because he's not made connection with Nityananda. Actually, Nityananda's name, his very name, suggests eternal, Ananda, pleasure. So this material pleasure that we're after is, is not eternal. So there's no distinction, there's no comparison between that. So this is very nice. Sri Prabhupada gives us the words of Narutama Das Thakur and then he gives his own nice purports so that we can understand. So here is some more of the song. Se Sambanda Nahijar Vritya Janma Gevotar Se Pasu Boro Durachar 
So here, he uses very harsh words. He says, such a human being is an animal, an uncontrollable animal, as there are some animals that cannot be tamed. So anyone who has not contacted Nityananda, he should be considered as an untamed animal. Se pasu bodha durachar. Why? Because Nityanai Badilo Mukhe. He never uttered the holy name of Nityananda. And it goes on here. As Majilo Samsara Sukhe. And becomes emerged into this material happiness. Vidya Kule Ki Kodi Vetar. That nonsense does not know that what will his education and family and tradition and nationality will help him. These things cannot help him. These are all temporary things. So this is if we simply want eternal pleasure, we have to contact Nunyatananda. This is that vidya means education, you know, kula means family, and nationality. So we may think, oh, I have a very nice family, you know, a very nice national prestige. But after in this body, these things won't help you. You'll carry on your work, yeah, you'll have to take another body. And that may not be a human body. So how can these things protect us? So Nityananda Prabhu, our Anartam Das Thakur, is recommending that Vidya Kuleki Kodi So just continuing here. Then he says, Ahankare Mata Hoya, being maddened after false prestige and identification, false identification of the body and prestige of body relations. It is called Ahankare Mata Hoya. One is mad after this false prestige. Ahankare Mata Hoya, Nitai Pada Pasaya. Due to this false prestige, we're thinking, oh, what is Nityananda? What can he do for me? I don't care. Then he says, Nityananda Karuna Habe, Braja Radha Krishna Pabe. If you're actually serious about going back home, back to Godhead, then please seek after the mercy of Nityananda. So again and again, we're being encouraged to seek the mercy of Nityananda and get rid of this false prestige, you know, thinking that, you know, I'm accepting. That's what it is. Actually, it's false prestige to accept something as false. And what is that? I'm this body. So that's the false identification. So if we're pop, puffed up with this false prestige, this ahankara mata hoya, you know, then you're going to accept something that's wrong is right. So here, this is a Haryanam Sankirtan in Siberia, Russia. But actually in Keturi, Sri Nartamadas Thakur, he arranged for a famous uh, Keturi Mahotsava. And that was the first Gopranim festival to honor the divine appearance of Sri Krishna Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And during this festival, there was six deities installed. There was a Sri Gaur, Gaurangadev, Sri Vallabha Kanta, there was a Sri Raja Mohana, there was a Sri Krishna and Sri Radha Kanta, and also Sri Radha Raman. And then uh, during this festival, Narutama Dasa's Thakur's voice was so sweet. He began this wonderful kirtan, and his chanting just filled the heavens, and it brought down tears of prema from the eyes of the devotees who were all sporting in an ocean of ecstasy. And in the midst of their kirtan, this Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu himself, the munificent Sri Chaitanya appeared and he joined in the Sankirtan. It was like a flash of lightning in the midst of the mass of the beautiful blue clouds. So Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu himself appeared in the crowd of the devotees through his divine manifestation. So here is someone depicted, I got this from Iskand Desire Tree, a picture of the devotees chanting and they they put in a picture of Lord Chaitanya there appearing amongst the devotees. So this is what it was like. He's such a beautiful voice. You know, to Madasta Kuri attracted Lord Chaitanya to appear. And for the first time, that festival featured many kirtan styles, 
it, it integrated the glorification of Lord Chaitanya with the glorification of Lord, Ch Lord Krishna and his pastimes. And because so many Vaishnavas were present at one place, it automatically made the Ketri festival extraordinary. And it also acted as an important step toward unifying all the Gaudiya Vaishnavas. Actually, this festival was a major achievement in, the, in Gaudiya Vaishnavism because there was like hundreds and hundreds of devotees. They were invited. Some of them were direct disciples of Chaitanya. Some were disciples of Nityananda. Some were disciples of Advaita Acharya. So some, there was a little difference that existed you know, in the interpretation of the Gaudiya Vaishnava philosophy. So this uh, Acharya, called Acharya, Acharya Rani, Janava Devi came. She came with her entourage, and she presided over all the Vaishnavas, and she preached to them, she resolved their diverse conclusions, and now they have one consistent Gaudiya Vaishnava philosophy. So this is what Janava Devi did, which is nice. So here's some excerpts from Prema Bhakti Chandrika. I think this is from Narutama Das Thakur also. Radha and Krishna are my goal in life and death, and they are the masters of my breath. Performing my bhajan only for them, I rise and fall in the ocean of prema. I pray that I can always maintain this conception with my heart as my highest goal. So just see, instead of focusing on you know, all mundane talks and bickerings and rumors and so many things. We just, our breath is just taken up in bhajan. And instead of falling in the ocean of birth and death, we'll fall and rise in the ocean of prema. Let me serve the lotus feet of Radha Govinda. Let my mind be filled with dedication to their divine forms. Let they feed the beauty of Cupid and Rati. With a straw between my te teeth, I fall at their divine feet and present my humble appeal. O oh, Kishore Kishori, O oh, son of Nanda Maharaj, Shama Sundar, O oh, daughter of King Vrishabhanu, Sri Radha, you enchant even Hari, and your bodily complexion is the color of a golden lotus. O oh, Krishna, with a bodily color like an Indra Nila gem, blue jewel, your beauty mocks Cupid. O oh, topmost dancers of Sri Radha and Sri Krishna, please dance within my mind. O oh, whose, you whose beauty increases the charm of your dazzling ornaments day and night, I only wish that I shall go on singing your glories in great ecstasy. So this is Narutama Das Thakur. He actually serves Srimati Radhika as Chamaka Manjari. And his samadhi is in Radha Gokulananda's temple courtyard. And this is Radha Krishna and his devotees engaged in the ocean of Prima. So this is the power of Srimad Bhagavatam. First canon verse, first fourth chapter, verse 19, which talks about the karma sudham, the purifying of our activities. And we had the perfect example of King Priti, who is an example to all our leaders today, who actually cared for the citizens and elevated them to this highest state of consciousness. So, thank you very much for your kind attention. And if there's any comments or questions, if you can still hear, if I didn't get cut off, you can open it up. Go to G, that was a wonderful class. I feel like if you ever, sometimes you're hungry, you sit down at a table, and you eat a big meal, and you stand up, and you know you're like completely satisfied. That's how I feel <laughs> after this wonderful class. I feel, oh, I almost overate. I guess you can never overeat the nectar of Bhagavatam. Just wonderful class. I did have a question. Sure, you made a statement. And at first, it struck me in an odd way. And then I started thinking about it, and I was, I've been warming up to it. You said, you referred to Prabhupada as the guru of the universe. 
And my first reaction to that was, well, we have to be very careful not to over-glorify Prof in an unrealistic way to where we start approaching and thinking of him as God. I, I always thought of Prabhupada as you know, the guru of, our, of, of this world, this planet. And that was my first reaction. Then I started thinking about it, and I was thinking, what did Goda really mean by that? And I was thinking, well, maybe, you know, maybe the sages in, in heavenly planets or in you know, elevated personalities uh, other places in the universe are, are, are reading Prabhupada's books, are, are, are learning from... Uh, the, the wealth of, of knowledge and realization that he's given to us. What were your thoughts on that when you referred to Prabhupada as, as guru of the universe? Is that, before, I never really thought of Prabhupada's influence so much beyond our planet. What were your thoughts? Okay. Go to Chinder. It looks like you have two sources, and that was creating a bit of an echo. So I'm not sure which source I just muted. Can you say something? You talking about me? Yeah, okay, there you go. I mean, you look like you had two sources. Anyway, I'm going to mute myself. Go ahead, please. Koda, did you hear my oh, question? Yeah. He did. I, I, uh, there was an echo because he has two sources, so let me unmute his other source. Just one second. Uh, okay, go to Peru. I think I just unmuted you. Sorry. Go ahead. Go to? No, God, I'm messing up here. Can you hear me? Now we can hear you. Go ahead. Okay. So, yes, uh, Narhari, I got that from the memories um, of uh, Bhakti Tirta Swami. He was talking about how when he first came to the movement, you know, before that, he was actually uh, kind of a disciple of many other mystics and yogis and great uh, spiritualists that he was studying under. And um, he actually had uh, joined Prabhupada. And he found Prabhupada and, you know, he came. And I think some of them even encouraged him to take up, Christ, you know, the Krishna conscious movement. So he, uh, you know, he was following, becoming a devotee for a while. And then he decided to go and, you know, ask a couple more questions to these, you know, these big mystics and great, you know, devotees or I guess uh, we'd call them yogis, mystics. And they actually got angry with him and they said, why are you coming back to us and inquiring from us when you have taken shelter of the guru of the entire universe? When he started preaching, we stopped. So just go back to him. That's where I got that from. So that's what they told Bhakti Tirta Swami. He's the guru of the entire universe. Why are you coming back to us? It's very interesting. I never thought like that, but I think yeah. I think there's some merit to that. It's really kind yeah. of broaden my perspective in that regard. I just forty some years. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, that really struck me when I heard that too. It was very nice. But uh, everything with the. Um, the animations, did they come through okay? Were you able to see them? It was really able to concentrate. How long did it take you to, to make this presentation? Well, you know, I've been practicing little by little. As you know, you noticed I was giving these seminars, and then I'm just more and more I'm adding a few more things. So yesterday I just took a little time off and just dived into it. So it's actually pretty easy once you get the learn how to use the tools. That's the hardest part is, you know, you, you know you want to do something, but you don't know exactly how to do it. So it takes a little time to figure it out at first, but then once you get it down, you could just whip it out. Just as easy as putting a Word document together, and, you know, adding some pictures and stuff. So it's actually pretty easy. It was wonderful. Yeah, Very helpful. Very helpful. Yeah, I'm glad you enjoyed it. Was my aim to please the devotees. So any other comments or realizations? But yeah, I recommend you watch that video that I uh, had the link there. I don't know if anybody was able to get it down, but it's uh, pretty interesting how it shows a state of affairs. You know, he's honestly telling what our situation is. And, uh, you know, where is the 
where's our leader like Pritum Arakas today? Maybe in the future there will be one who actually cares about the citizens and elevates them. So, Hi. any more comments? Um, Hi, Hi Krishna. Krishna, this is Radhana Rupini. Haribo, Madam. You have, this is such a wonderful class. I haven't seen class in a while because I'm one of the working people. <laughs> But the visuals are so wonderful. It just keeps you with everything. Um, thank you so much. But I also wanted to see that I saw a documentary on happiness. Oh, yeah? I have Netflix, and I love documentaries, so I'm a documentary junkie. <laughs> and I watch, I like to watch documentaries. So one of them was on happiness. And it did state that um, there is a certain, they say you can't get happiness from money. But there's a certain point where if you're on the street, destitute, with no food and no shelter, and then all of a sudden you're given that food and shelter, that there is a certain happiness that you can, you know, because you're under food and shelter. But they did say that after a person earns more than 50000 a year, mm -hmm. he actually become more miserable. Yeah. Because they just keep on this, then they show this woman walking on like a, almost like a treadmill circle, you know, picking up shoes and bags and clothes and all kinds of things that maybe materially she's, uh, you know, uh, wanting and yeah. mi miserable, looking very miserable. So, um, so there's a, you know, maintenance because we, we are in this world and we need to maintain so there's a point of maintenance but beyond um, excessiveness is not necessary but this is uh, now I have a question for you Prabhu I, I've been thinking about this um, mm -hmm. is through my years of being a devotee I've also seen some devotees that um, have this like nature it's like their dharma and their go-getters and they know how to make a lot of Lakshmi. And they're jet setters, and they have huge homes and great businesses, and you know. But it's like, for some people, it's it's not in their nature, and for some people, it is in their nature. So, like, the only thing I'm seeing is that if it's in your nature, then you use it in the service of Krishna. But Sometimes I see also that they use some of it in the service of Krishna, and, and yet some of it is difficult. So, um, can you say something about that, Prabhu? Uh, yeah, thank you. That was nice. Uh, also, first I'd like to mention that you mentioned about a documentary, I think. The devotees did one, too, uh, about uh, happiness. And uh, they were analyzing how the people in countries like India that had hardly anything, they very simply, they were the most happy people and the happiest people in the world. I think it was entitled the most happiest people in the world. Is that, is that Prabhu because there's more um, uh, expression of gratitude towards each other, expression of love and concern towards each other, um, more yeah, than just finances. Um, I also saw another documentary where it was about that um, a monkey that was taken away from its mother at birth and and all the mental disease it got as it grew up because of not having that love and affection. Sure. Yeah, I think as more as we get advanced, you know, there's so many unnecessary things that people get distracted by. And, you know, people that are very simply, they just, you know, like lived in a village, they had their family, they, you know, would play with nature and so many things, they'd be completely satisfied. Whereas now we have so many gadgets and so many things that distract us from our real nature that we start to develop love of things instead of love of people. You know, so we just, that you can see people, you know, there's like a comments about how People spend more time on their gadgets than they do with their wives, you know, these days. 
But yeah, this is the distraction. That's just one example. There's so many other examples like that. But you know, as far as devotees, you know, our karma, you know, we should be satisfied with whatever position we're in and thank Krishna for what we have. But we should be grateful, yes, and try to utilize what we can in Krishna's service. Not that we should think, oh, you know, uh, I need to go and over-endeavor and just spend all my time working hard in order to work at a job that I don't like so that I can continue living in a lifestyle that's causing me to just live, mm-hmm. you know, unhappy. Mm-hmm. But, you know, if we're just satisfied by whatever comes by nature, then we'll be satisfied because actually happiness comes from within. We can be happy in any condition of life. Because our happiness is not determined on external things. Actually, real happiness comes from within. And that's the contact we have with Krishna. And we can see the example in Uttamadas Thakur. He was completely, I mean, he didn't have a mansion or he was a brahmachari his whole life. And he just was living and diving in the ocean of nectar. He was completely satisfied and happy. So there's many examples of great personalities. Great king like Prithu Maharaj. He was a great king, and he was just completely, you know, always doing things, you know, for Krishna, you know, in, in a proper way, you know, love for the citizens to help elevate them, concern for others' spiritual advancement. Otherwise, we end up like our society today, as you see in that video, if you guys ever get a chance to watch it, how, you know, our, our uh, leaders, they're completely selfish, they're just interested in themselves. And they're doing so many illegal things, outright lies and illegal things. And it goes name after name, one after another, describing in detail. So many examples. You know, huge companies, how they're cheating. and like that. This is what happens when we get our focus and we get our whole purpose of life distorted. We become, we, we understand the false thing as true things. So then we, we end up losers. Society ends up losers, you know, destroying nature so much. We could just go on and on. But yeah, thanks for sharing that. Any other comments or questions? Realizations? Jai. That was a wonderful presentation, Peru. Beautiful. Yeah, thank you. Came through great. Uh, I'm glad it worked out, and I'm, I'm satisfied if you're satisfied. So uh, I guess uh, we can all go and engage in our devotional services. So thank you for your kind attention. All glories to the Srimad Bhagavatam. Jai. Thank you, Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna.